Love it. Love it. Come on, guys. Let's give it up for what Jesus is doing in Avery's life. Uh, that is that is more like it. Very touching, very powerful personal story. Welcome to our baptism bash. Between the two services, we've got 40 plus people being water baptized. All right. Most of you know our theme for the year is real, right? And uh, what it's about is just having real encounters with the Holy Spirit. And uh, I think it's about time we model to this generation real Christianity. All right. Thank you back there, brother. I'll give you 20 bucks later. All right. And welcome to our series, Real Buy-In. This is part two, right? If you got your Bible, go to Matthew 28 as well as Mark 8. We'll get there in a little bit. Remember, I gave a definition last week on what buy-in is or what real buy-in is. Uh, it's accepting, acceptance of and a willingness to actively support and participate in something. That's what buy-in is. Um, I think a great trendy, we'll call it description, maybe an example of buy-in is Chick-fil-A. Let me think Chick-fil-A might be a good example of buy-in. Now, personally, um, I like Chick-fil-A, but the buy-in has gotten a bit crazy. I don't get the radical you know, buy-in that so many people are into. Um, what's really crazy are the Chick-fil-A lines. Now, I will say this, they move incredibly fast, but you want to talk about some craziness, it's the lines. You ever go to the Hall Road uh, Chick-fil-A? You know, it's just unreal. The lines go down M59. They're taking orders on the street. I'm not kidding you. How many think that might be kind of cool for either the rock shop or the rock cafe? We start taking orders down, down county line, you know? I will say this, uh, Chesterfield, you better buckle up because Chick-fil-A is on the way, right? They're coming to 23 in Gratiot. Just what we need, more traffic on 23 in Gratiot. Let's have a word of prayer. Oh. Now, I... I guess most people have really bought into that Chick-fil-A has the best chicken sandwiches. First service is all into it, right? Or maybe people have bought in, they have the best waffle fries. I don't know if they have the best chicken sandwiches or the best waffle fries, but I will say this. I have bought into their special sauce. You could put that sauce on just about anything, except for pasta. How many know what I'm talking about, right? Um, the other thing that I've really bought into is their service. Ain't no one out serving Chick-fil-A, right? Um, we were at a Chick-fil-A, this is years ago, when my son Nick turned 15. And we're in the dining room, and I don't know, one of the waitresses, whatever you call them, walked up to my son and said, I hear it's your birthday. And she handed my son a giant free shake. And my son said, yeah, I got a stomachache, no thank you. I looked at that waitress and said, he'll take the shake. <laughs> and I looked at my boy and said, don't you ever do that again. <laughs> you degrade the family. Uh, we will get rid of you, not the shake. <laughs> anyway. Now, you might know that Chick-fil-A is a Christian-owned company or business, right? right? They have biblical values. And they also have a, a, like a biblical mission statement. Uh, Chick-fil-A's primary core value and or mission is this. Listen to this. To glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that is entrusted to us. Sounds like a church, right? I mean, what an incredible mission statement, man. I tell you what, if you own your own business and you have the ability to write your own mission statement, I would piggyback off something like that. Rock Church has biblical values as well as a biblical mission statement. And some of you know it. It's reaching, raising, releasing, and reproducing generations for Christ. 
That is our mission statement. And our mission, it just comes right out of the heart of the mission of Jesus Christ. You know, we didn't, you know, nothing new under the sun. We just took a bunch of principles and statements that Jesus said and made a mission statement, right? And it's a mission statement for his followers. It's a mission statement for his church. We kind of dug into that a little bit last week. So I'm going to give you some quick review. In part one of Real Buy-In, we focused on reaching people, reaching people. And I asked the question, do we have real buy-in to reach lost people for Jesus? That's a good question. You know, let's just stop here for a second. It's been a week, right, for most of you. Do we have real buy-in to reach lost people for Jesus, or are we still thinking about buying in? In part two today, we're going to get into raising people. And you might think, raising people to what? And I would say raising up people to spiritually grow up. How many think Christians need to spiritually grow up? How many think you might be one of those Christians? Thank you. We're talking about raising up people to spiritually mature, right? We're talking about raising up people to become faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ultimately, what we're talking about is raising up disciples. We're, we're talking about raising up disciple makers for Jesus. See, this is kind of how it works, is, is once a lost person has been found, once a lost person is forgiven and, and freed up, come on now, from their sins, right? And they've been reached by the Holy Spirit. They've been saved. They've been baptized. Don't miss this. Once a person has been baptized, once they've been saved, right, what happens? Now that person needs to become a disciple, right? They need to spiritually be raised up. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. I would define discipleship, a real basic definition would be disciplined learner and follower. That's what a disciple is, right? And notice it's the ER on the end of learner and follower. And the reason why it's there is because a real disciple of Jesus Christ never stops learning and following, right? It's a continual thing. That's really important. It's like I've arrived as a disciple. You never arrive fully as a disciple. You are on a journey of discipleship with the Holy Spirit to become more like Jesus. Amen? Amen. One of my friends and somebody that discipled Kimmy and I, a guy named Dave Beering, he said this. He says, a real disciple of Jesus Christ makes disciple makers for Jesus Christ. I mean, that'll wake you up in the morning. You know, he's saying, hey, if you're a real disciple of Jesus... You're going to make disciple makers for Jesus. I kind of like that. It's pretty challenging. I want you to listen to a couple of scriptural passages that Jesus said about his disciples, his disciples on his mission. The first one is Matthew 28, and we'll start in verse 19. Remember, this is Jesus talking. He says, therefore, go. Going what? Going make disciples of all nations. That's all ethnic groups, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So here Jesus, he, he brings out how his disciples are to go. Understand that when he's talking about going here, he's really talking about as you're going through life. Discipleship isn't just a course or an event, something you put on your calendar. What Jesus is saying, as you go through life, while you're working, come on now, while you're going to school, while you're golfing, good or bad, you should be making disciple makers, is what Jesus is saying here. He also brings out some other stuff that's pretty challenging. He says his disciples get water baptized. Let's give it up one more time for those who are getting water baptized. That's what he says. But, but, but he doesn't stop there. He says they get water baptized and they obey. Not just know, because a lot of us are Christians that know Christ's commands and we know Christ's teachings, but that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said his disciples obey, they apply his commands and his teachings. Can I get an amen? All right, thank you. We're going to go to Mark now, chapter 8. This is a little bit more challenging. Whew. You thought Matthew was tough. Wait till you hear what Jesus said in Mark 8, 34. 
and we'll read all the way to 38. It says, Then Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples, and he said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. I mean, that'll wake you up in the morning. Here Jesus brings out how his disciples deny themselves, right? They lose their life in order to what? Gain life. Society and culture is saying, go after everything you can get. And Jesus is like, give it away and you'll finally get. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just contrary to culture. He also brings out here in, in Mark 8 to carry our cross daily, right? And to follow him. And then he says, don't be ashamed of me, right? If you're a disciple of mine, Jesus is like, you're not going to be ashamed of me. If you are ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed of you. So don't be ashamed of him or his message, his gospel. Now, for us to put a dent in our, say that with me, say our, our. We're talking about our discipleship dilemma. It's our neglecting of, of making disciples. For us to put a dent in that today, I, have, I just have two questions. Two primary questions, and hopefully these two questions will help us to put a dent in the discipleship dilemma, our lack of discipleship. A is this. Do I have real buy-in that I need to be discipled? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll get there in a bit. It's just a question, all right? Now, I'm going to begin to put some answers to this question, and you're going to find out in the next 15 minutes or no, if you got real buy-in. Because sometimes we, intellectually we got buy-in, but the real question is, has your life really bought in to being discipled? And I don't care, you know, how long you've been coming to church or how long you've been a Christian. This is a question for all of us. I said, this is a question for all of us. Okay, even the seasoned saints out there. Because sometimes you, get a, you become a seasoned saint, whatever that means, all right? And you forget that you too still need to be a learner and a follower and to be discipled. Some Christians think they've spiritually arrived. Not you guys. It was the first service, right? They thought they spiritually arrived, right? You know? You know? Again, they might go to church, you know, consistently. They might love powerful sermons, right? You know, they might even take notes. But is anyone really pouring into them? Is anyone free to speak into their life? And that's a good question for everybody here today. Are people really free to speak into your life and then maybe challenge your beliefs and challenge your behaviors? Disciples allow other people to speak into their life. Are you with me? What I'm really saying is this. If real buy-in has to do with your need to have a Paul in your life. And I know we've talked about this a lot throughout the years here at Rock Church. But Pauls represent the apostle Paul. Pauls are believers, Right? that are more mature in the faith than, than you are. Does anybody know a believer that's more mature in the faith than you are? If you can't raise your hand, that's because you're full of P-I-R, big I, D-E, all right? We should all know at least one believer out there that's more mature in the faith, right? They, they're more seasoned than we are, right? They're, they, they have been discipled, and they're really mature in the Lord more than what, what where I've gotten to so far in my life. That's, what, that's a Paul. And I'm really challenged. I am moved by what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It is just an incredible portion of Scripture. We're going to read from verse 14 through verse 17. Listen to Paul here, chapter 4, 1 Corinthians. It says, I am writing this not to shame you, but to what? To warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. 
For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Some great stuff there. I'm going to read verse 15 again, but I'm going to read it in the Amplified Version, where it says this, for even if you were to have 10,000 teachers, if you had 10,000 instructors to guide you in Christ, yet you, you, you would not have many fathers. What's he trying to get across here? Paul is talking about our lack of spiritual fathers. He's talking about the lack of spiritual mothers and mentors who are raising up disciples. He's like, where are the, where are the, the, the father figures, the spiritual father figures and mentors and mothers who will teach you how to follow Jesus is what Paul's saying here right? And how many know this is still a problem in our churches today? You know, this is still an issue in our churches today. You know, however, I would say this, there were people like Silas in the scriptures and, and, and Titus and Timothy who bought in. What did they buy into? They bought into Paul's fathering. They bought into Paul's training. They bought into Paul's teachings and his instructions, right? They bought into Paul's mentoring. They bought into Paul's spiritually raising them. Ultimately, there were people in Paul's day that bought into Paul discipling them. And today, there are still people like Silas and Titus and Timothy who are buying in. What are they buying into? They're buying into being spiritually fathered. We have people today that are still buying in, saying, I need to be spiritually fathered. I need to be spiritually mothered. I need to be spiritually mentored. I need to be spiritually raised up, and I need to be spiritually discipled. There are still people here today that are like Silas, Titus, and Timothy. However, today there are still many people who hear teachings but are not really buying into being spiritually fathered. They hear teachings. They might be on their podcast and listen to these great teachings better than this one. But they have not bought into being spiritually fathered, mothered, mentored, raised, and or discipled. It reminds me of a story that I tell about every two years. It has to do with a guy named Reggie Lewis. Reggie collapsed on the basketball course, court. He went and visited five to six heart specialists. Don't miss this. And all of them said, due to your heart disease, your basketball career is over. Finally, one doctor said, take this medication and you can play basketball again. And Reggie bought into one doctor's advice, one doctor's counsel, one doctor's diagnosis. When Reggie returned to playing basketball, Reggie died on the court. And you said, well, why did he die? I'm going to go with Reggie, listen to someone he wanted to hear instead of someone he needed to hear. And that's what many immature, non-discipled, mentorless, motherless, and fatherless Christians are doing today. See, many believers go from Christian to Christian to Christian to Christian to Christian to Christian, maybe even slip in a non-Christian or two in there. Many believers go from Christian to Christian until they hear what they want to hear instead of what? What they need to hear. That was a good time for an amen or something. It's an epidemic today. Listen, we need to stop Stop. Say it with me. Stop going to so-called Christians who are lukewarm, on the fence, fault finders, chronic complainers, rebellious, passionless, undermining others, and only have social media courage. We need to stop going to them. We need to stop going to so-called Christians who are not under any real spiritual fathers, mothers, or mentors. I mean, that should be a clue. 
If you're going to go to someone to help you in your spiritual walk, and we need to, amen? A great question to ask them is, who's mentoring you? Who's a spiritual mother in your life? Who is one of your spiritual fathers? Who's speaking into your life? Because they surely don't have a right to speak into your life if no one has freedom to speak into theirs. You need to stop going to people who do not have somebody that can speak some tough things into somebody else's life. Yet we continue to do it. We need to stop going to so-called Christians who are not discipling others to follow the real Jesus. Stop going to those types of people. I didn't say you couldn't go have a burger with them. All right? All right? If you're going to go have a burger with them, make them buy. Someone say amen, all right? You can go have a burger with them, but you're not going to them for spiritual advice, insights, right? You're not doing that. They don't have a Paul in their life. They don't have someone speaking into their life. And start, start, start going to disciple makers. I don't know how else to say it. Go to people who will tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly in you, right? Not the good, bad, and the ugly in your mama, right? Not the good, bad, and the ugly in your pastor. Not the good, the bad, and the ugly in, in their spouse. They will tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly in you. You need people in your life like that. Christians becoming mature disciples of Jesus Christ seek out Pauls in their lives that inspire them spiritually as also stretch them spiritually. You see the... the, 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 the the combination there, the balance there. If you want to become a mature disciple of Jesus Christ, you need to seek out Pauls in your life that will inspire you. Because I don't know about you, I need to be inspired, right? But I don't just need to be inspired. I need to be stretched because God sees greatness in me and he sees greatness in you. And you need someone that will inspire you but also stretch you spiritually. Those are Pauls, right? I've had numerous polls, and I know most of you have heard these stories throughout the years. But we do have some new people, right? Charlie was probably my first Paul. He was my first spiritual father, and he ended up becoming my, my father-in-law, praise the Lord, right? But he had such a healthy balance of speaking truth into my life and speaking grace into my life. I learned the concept of grace and truth from Charlie. He had no problem speaking truth. If he saw something in my life, he was going to let me know, but he would also, also speak grace and God's forgiveness into my life. He was an encourager, but also a challenger. And generally speaking, that's what Pauls will do. They'll encourage you, but they'll also, they'll also challenge you. My youth pastor, we weren't super close, but I will say this, he challenged my character and my leadership. He was the guy that said, yeah, you got some charisma, you got some giftings, but your character don't match, don't match your giftings. And you want to become this great leader, but you're not letting me or others speak into your life to help you with your character flaw. And once I started opening up to him saying, okay, speak into my life, you'd be amazed at what God started to do. Dave Beering, who I, who I um, quoted earlier, said some of the most direct personal challenges to Kim and I. Oh, but he just, he just had a way of doing it with such, such a, an awesome, loving tone, you know? Um, question, have you really bought into Christ's call to be one of his disciples? And you answer that by, do I have a Paul? Or are you seeking, searching, and praying for a Paul? That's really important, guys. You might want to elbow the person next to you and say, wake up. This is a good question because if, if you really want to mature in the Lord, reach your potential and your purpose that he's given to you, right, your calling, you got to seek out, you got to search out, and you got to pray for a Paul. And you will be surprised at how God will answer that prayer. He will send somebody your way that will speak into your life. And today, I've, I'm still buying into the need for Paul's in my life. Some of you know Pastor Jeff Christ. Okay, I'm going to tell you right now, the guy don't play, play games. I just had dinner with him. After he spoke a bunch of tough stuff to me, I said, you're paying. All right? If I'm listening, you're paying, baby. Right, he spoke some really tough stuff into my life, and I love it because I need that. I mean, I don't love it while it's happening. Three hours later, you're going, man, I needed that one. Some of you know Brad Trask. You know, he's another pastor out in Brighton. Um, he's one of my uh, present and needy, needy encouragers. When I need to be built up, 
because I'm in the dumps. I'm getting a little depressed. I call Brad, and he speaks life into my life. You know what I'm saying? And I know, I know most of you know Rick Bosnick. He's been here 400 times, right? A good friend of mine. I call him when I need to laugh, right? And God uses him to stretch my spirit. So here's the question before we move on to our next question. Do you have real buy-in that you need, you need to circle up with people more mature in the faith than you? That's the question before we move on. Do you have real buy-in that you need to hang around? You need to circle up with people that are more mature in the faith than you. You, got, you know the answer to that. If you're not, how many know today you can start buying in, right? You're not going to reach your potential if you don't get real buy-in that you need to circle up with people more mature in the faith than you. And ultimately, you need a Paul if you want to become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ or someone like a Paul. B is a little bit of a different question. Do I have real buy-in that I need to be, I need to be discipling others? Let me say that again. Do I have real buy-in that I need to disciple others? Now go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. This question is even for those of us who have been Christians for a long time and have gone to church for a long time. Because the longer you go to church, I want you to know that should give you more opportunity to find Timothys to pour into. Are you with me? Because that's really what we're asking here. Where we, we said first, we said you need a Paul in your life, someone more mature in the faith than you. Timothy's a little bit different. Timothy's are believers less mature in the faith than you are. Timothy's are, are people who are, are Christians that are less mature in the faith than you are. Does anybody know anybody who's a Christian who's less mature in the faith than you are? Anybody, all right? If you can't raise your hand, that's a real problem. I would encourage you to be a little more social, all right? Because we should all know somebody in our life that, man, you know, they're a Christian, but I think I might be a little bit more mature than them. They're not as mature as I am in the Lord. I've been doing this thing 10 years. They've been doing it for 10 minutes. I mean, if you've been doing it for 10 years and they've been doing it for 10 minutes, how many know you should be more mature? That wasn't real convincing. I'm extremely challenged by what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy 1, verse 2. And sometimes we read stuff like this, and it just blows right over. We want to get to the, the meaty stuff of the epistle or the letter that Paul wrote to the churches, right? Listen to this, 1 Timothy 1, 2. To Timothy, my what? My what kind of son? My true son in the faith. I'm thinking this, if Timothy is a true son in the faith, that means there are some false sons in the faith, right? How many know that's another message for another time, right? Again, Paul is sharing about the kind of spiritual relationship it takes to raise up new believers or younger believers in Christ or in the faith. We need to become spiritual fathers. We need to become spiritual mothers, spiritual mentors, and spiritual disciples. This is what Paul's saying here. And some seasoned believers, and I don't know how you define seasoned believers, but some seasoned believers, some people who, are, who have the potential to be a Paul, which really is all of us, have bought into some lies. We've bought into some lies like, you know, the younger and the newer generation of Christians don't really want to be discipled. That's not necessarily true. And others of us have bought into the lie that this is my time. I discipled Christians in the 80s and the 90s, you know? I get to enjoy the final quarter of my Christian walk, right, you know? I get to spiritually retire. How many know you and I never get to spiritually retire? You never get to punch out and go, you know what, I'm done. I've been doing this thing 35 years, and no longer am I going to disciple the next generation. You just don't, you don't, you don't get to do that. It does not sound like a disciple of Jesus Christ to me, right? This is another one that's classic. We buy into the lie that I cannot take getting hurt, rejected, or betrayed one more time. I've been there. It's not a fun season or place to be in. I get it. I've had many who I've raised up in the Lord just jet. They ghost you and they're gone. How many know what I'm talking about? Some even go as low as bashing me on social media. Do I look bashable? I asked my wife in the first service if that was a word. She said, no, it's not. Don't use it again. Did I listen? No. But 
that's what happens many times, you know? And when that happens, we kind of go, you know, forget back. I'm going to just pull back. You know, I, I tried to raise that person up. I tried to disciple that person. They threw me under the bus. Nevertheless, the truth is, like any previous generation, I encourage you to still seek out potential Timothys. Because there are people that will allow you to raise them up. Come on now. Mentor them, mother them, father them, and disciple them. All right, before we move on, are there any kids in the house? Any kids in here right now? Raise your hand if you're a kid. Not if you want to be. I wish you were. Raise your hand if you're a kid. All right, that means like you're, we'll say 12 and under, all right? 11 and a half and under. Raise your hand. Would you stand up, please? If you're a kid, everybody stand up. Stay up. Come on. Let's give it up. Stay up. All right. I love it. Incredible. Don't go sitting yet. Stay up. Stay up. Stay up. Listen, listen. I just want to say this. Our kids need spiritual fathers. I said our kids need spiritual mothers. Every kid in here needs spiritual mentors. Our kids need someone who will spiritually raise them up and disciple them. Where else are they going to get it? You want them to just get discipled in their public schools? You want them to just get discipled in their neighborhoods? You want social media to start discipling our kids? How many think the church is called to disciple our kids? Just trying to help you a little bit. All right, if, 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 you're, a, if you're a student or a young adult, would you please stand? Come on, get up. Stay standing. Nobody asked you to sit yet. Let's go. You can obey Paul or not. I need you to stand, all right. I would say the same thing, church. Either we're going to disciple our students and our young adults, or the bartender's going to. Or TikTok is going to. Don't get me going, all right? And I'm here to tell you that the call to train up, instruct, raise up, and disciple uh, our students and our young adults are those of us who are more mature in the faith than they are. It's called the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm challenging us. Don't look at them and go, oh my goodness, why you got your head on backwards? Look at him and go, why is your life going backwards? Let me help you go the right way. Amen? I mean, that's what we're, we're called to do. All right, grab a seat. Woo, I love it. You guys are packing out the house today. Okay, now I got I to gotta talk to you Timothys a little bit. Because you're getting off a little easy. Paul's are feeling like, what in the world? I ain't doing nothing for Jesus. So let's talk to Timothy for a minute. Timothys. You need to be the aggressor in the discipleship relationship. Another way of saying that is, if you want to be discipled, come to your mentor hungry. Get time for an amen. If you're waiting for Paul to come knocking on your door, he ain't going to do it. You knock on Paul's door, right? I'm going to age myself, but there's an old movie, and I think it's clean, it's called What About Bob? How many have seen it? You know? I think you can watch it. I could be wrong. It's been a while. Okay? But I love that character. He is driving that counselor crazy. And I'm here to tell you, if you want to get discipled, you've got to be the aggressor. You've got to be like Bob on that front porch almost every other day. You've got to be on that phone. Let's FaceTime together. You've got to say, let's have a Zoom call. You've got to say, I will take you out to eat. You've got to be the aggressor. Paul's not going to be the aggressor. Paul's are busy. How many know the world is run by busy people, right? And Paul's people that are pouring into people, they're busy. And they're looking for you to be the aggressor. And I'm encouraging you and challenging you to bother them. Call them up. Hang out with them. When they see you hungry, they will feed you spiritually. Someone say amen. amen. I'll give you another thought, Timothy. Timothys, you need to be open to spiritual instruction, inspiration, and stretching. You need to be open to all that. Let me say that again. You need to be open to spiritual inspiration, instructions, and stretching. Some of you are like, well, I don't mind the inspiration and the instruction, but don't stretch me. And others of you are like, you can stretch me and instruct me, but I don't want to be inspired. You need both. You need all three of those bad boys. Amen? Can I just say this to you, Timothy? Don't be so touchy. 
You know, don't be so offended when your Paul speaks something tough to you. Right? That's kind of what happens sometimes. You know, your Paul will speak something direct and something tough to your spirit. Maybe direct to your life, maybe tough to your heart, even to your ministry. Say, say I'm not going to be too touchy, amen? I'm not going to be offended. And, and Timothy's, listen, don't go to wishy-washy, what's in it for me? No one's going to tell me what to do, so-called Christians. Stop doing that. I'm going to say that again. Timothy, don't go to wishy-washy, what's in it for me? No one's going to tell me what to do, so-called Christians, to complain to them about what your Paul said to you. That's a classic line with a lot of people. Your Paul speaks something straightforward. Your Paul stretches your spirit, and you go to wishy-washy Christians. Instead of going to wishy-washy pansy Christians, go to Jesus. I said, go to Jesus. And take what that person said to you and take it to Jesus and see what Jesus says for you to do. Amen? Amen. You know, it kind of goes like this. Let's see if I can kind of role play here for a second. Can you believe what so and said, so and so said about me? They're talking about their Paul, you know, somebody more mature in the faith than them. Can you believe what they said about me? They said I have a rebellious attitude. Do I look rebellious to you? You know, they, they, said, they said that I refuse feedback. They said that every time someone tries to give me feedback, I get really defensive right away. Are you kidding me right now? And you're like, you know, you're just staring at them. They come to you and they're like, you know, you, you, you know and they're like, you know what? That bitterness is going to take you down. You're the one in bondage when you're bitter and, and you're wrestling with unforgiveness. And your Paul will challenge you and say, get rid of the bitterness and get rid of the unforgiveness and take it to the cross, right? And then you're like, I can't believe he said I don't have a right to be bitter, angry, or full of revenge, you know? Ultimately, Sometimes we're like, do you believe it? Paul said that, my Paul, my spiritual mentor said that I have an attitude. Whew. Now, here's the thing. You know the person is being immature and has a tude, right? You know that, right? But you buckle and you affirm their behavior and you affirm their attitude. Ultimately, what you do is you affirm their sin. And here's how it works. Then they go about life justifying their behavior, justifying their attitudes, and justifying their sins. Why do they go justifying their attitudes, their behaviors, and their sins? Because you, who are supposed to be more spiritual than them, gave them the right to justify it, right? I'm not saying that they should justify it. I'm saying that if you justify those types of attitudes, you're speaking in their life, it is okay to stay immature, Instead of take that counsel, take that rebuke, take that challenging statement to the cross and see what Jesus would have you do. Fair enough? All right. Some of you love me, some of you don't. Either way, you're getting ready to hear one of my favorite stories. My wife hates it. She fasted this week and said, don't you dare share that story again. But I'm not going to listen to her. I'm going to go out on a limb. And I'm going to tell you, the story that I tell every two years, it's about the booger. How many are ready? All right. I'm on a bus ride. I'm on a bus ride home from a beach in Canada. I'm sitting in one of the bus seats, and, and Kimmy's a few rows ahead of me, and she starts giving me some signals and some signs. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, all right? Uh, she's touching her nose and she's touching, and then I realize, I get a revelation, right? That I have a booger on the outside of my nose, and it's the size of a nickel. How many know what I'm talking about? You know? <laughs> now that I got your attention. Question, who here would want someone to tell you you got a booger on the outside of your nose? If you can't raise your hand, you got some, you better crawl to the altar. <laughs> we would all want to know that we got a booger on the outside of our nose. The real question is this. Can your Paul, your circle, 
call out sins in your life? Can your Paul, can your circle call out sins in your life? Because to me, it's kind of crazy how we buy in, we buy into someone calling out a booger that really only hurts your pride, your ego, and your image. But few buy into calling out my sins, my attitudes, my bitterness, my unforgiveness, my offenses, my greed, my gluttony, and or my gossip. And all those hurt my testimony, my circle, my relationships, my leadership, my ministry, my life team, my life group, my life, my heart, and my spirit. See how crazy things have gotten. Where, tell me there's a bugger, but don't tell me about things in my life that Jesus wants out of my life. Real disciples will speak into a Timothy, and a Timothy will be open and saying, show me some things, some beliefs and behaviors that I have that don't honor God the Father, and help me to get rid of those in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my past and present uh, Timothys is a guy named Larry Parker. You guys might remember him. Larry Parker was in our youth group. Um, this dude was filled with absolutely no confidence. He was as shy as can be. He was fatherless. He had no people skills. He was a real hot mess. However, Larry was teachable. Come on now, he was coachable. And he got radically, I mean radically transformed. He got radically discipled and became a great leader for Kim and I. Years later, Larry became one of our youth group, one of our youth pastors here at Rock Church. I mean, years later, the dude becomes a, a pastor here at Rock Church. Now Larry is pastoring an incredible church in Warren, Michigan. And him and I still get together three or four times a year to pour into one another's lives. I'm a Paul to him still. He sold Timothy to me. Every now and then, what is, he, takes the, he takes the Paul lead, and I become the Timothy. And this is really cool. For me, it is anyways. This fall, I get the honor of speaking to his leadership team on a Saturday. And the very next day on a Sunday, I get to speak to his church. It's just incredible what God can do. Um, during COVID, um, Kimmy and I received a Facebook message uh, from a student that was in our youth group. She said, call me when you guys are free. We set up a time to talk. And when we, I think we're FaceTiming, and, and, and she's like, she's like um, I just want to thank you for discipling me. That's all she wanted to do. I hadn't seen her in 15 years, maybe 20 because I, I just want to thank you for discipling, for discipling me. And then she opened up this binder, this folder, right? And she just, she just started showing me all these fill-in-the-blank, you know, sermon notes. And she was like, remember this teaching that you did on spiritual warfare? And I'm like, yeah, I remember that one. And she was like, that was 12 weeks long. You did a 12-week teaching on spiritual warfare in the youth group. Friends, if I did a 12-week series on Sunday morning here at Rock Church, you would send me emails. I'm just saying, right? I mean, it was just incredible. And Kimmy and I just got off that Facebook time saying, praise the Lord. Some present Timothys. Um, Pastor Peyton's a Timothy in my life. Who do you think taught him how to organize? Parker's a Timothy in my life. Hope I can say this. Who do you think kind of taught him how to attack a buffet? I mean, I'm saying, come on. You know what I'm saying, you know? Delane's a Timothy in my life. Who do you think trained her how to design the commons? I mean, who do you think did all that? You know what I'm saying? Bree's a Timothy in my life. Who do you think trained her how to write shorter texts? I mean, it was me. It was me. It was me. She's going to beat me up, all right? Carly's a... Uh, uh, Timothy in my life. I taught her how to love those little kids. <laughs> Dolly is a Timothy in my life. Who do you think taught her how to speak Spanish? Oh, yeah, come on. <laughs> Even Jake. Even Jake is a Timothy in my life. Who do you think taught him how to sing? <laughs> come on. Huh? 
Praise the Lord. Got interns that go to Rock Church here. Who do you think taught them how to make the coffee? <clears throat> Pastor Steve and I tend to be Paul's and Timothy's to, to each other. Who do you think taught them the Greek? <laughs> All right. Some of you are getting this, some of you aren't. This past Thursday, I was the guest speaker, discipler on a pastor's Zoom cohort. Really cool, great opportunity. I might talk about it a little bit more next week. But it seemed to go really well. Um, and this is what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that I picked up a couple of new Timothys. You know, there was no huge group of people on this, on this cohort, but it was kind of cool as they began to ask me questions afterwards on the topic that I taught on. Listen, you must buy in. You are called to pay the price with your time, talents, and treasures. If, if you want to be a Paul, a disciple. You want to be a Paul to somebody, it's going to cost you some time, some talents, and some treasures. You're going to be open to being a Timothy, have a Paul in your life that will speak into your life. It's going to cost you some time, some talents, as well as some treasures. And I'm asking you to buy in to paying the price with your time, your talents, and your treasures. Okay. Our rock kids, our rock students, and our rock young adults are all strategically structured in circles. They're all strategically structured in groups. And you may be going, well, why? To make disciple makers, right? They're sitting in rows right now, and they're freaking out a little bit, man, because they're used to sitting in circles because we want them to have to pour into one another, right? Most of you know we have a three Circle strategy. Got a picture of that bad boy on the, on the screen right now. We talked about this a lot last year. But you attend and you invite to Sunday services. Well, why would I want to do that? So people can become Christians and so that people can get discipled. Can I get an amen? amen? Right? And we're trying to get people to understand that consistency to Sunday, right? If you'll consistently come to Sunday, you're here teaching that you are able to obey and you can become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And why would we want you serving on a team? Don't just serve on a team so that you can get that off your schedule once a month. You serve on a team because you have teammates that will be Paul's to you and you have teammates that will be Timothy's to you, right? If you're on a team, you are called to disciple one another. May that be the main reason why you were on a team, not just to get closer to Jesus, but to help others get closer to Jesus. Can I get an amen, right? And why would I ever want to be in a life group? Because you're in community, and when you're in community, there's a accountability. And when there's accountability, you allow your Paul to speak into your life and you're in a group and you allow that Timothy, you begin to speak into that Timothy's life. And I want us to make sure that we don't look at, 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 at times in groups just to get through a curriculum. Got to finish the course. Another book is I can just check off. We're done, and I help facilitate. No, you are there to make disciple makers. Yeah. Amen. You're not just there to check off another Bible study. <sighs> two courses, two groups that I would strongly encourage you to consider is foundational truths in new life. And the reason why is those two structures, the structures, the strategy of foundational truths and new life, the strat you look them up on our website to get more information about it, but the strategies there are to disciple you so that you learn how to disciple others. Man. All right, two quick questions and I'll get you out of here. We'll start dunking some people. I may dump in, jump in because I'm hot. But uh, are you still bought in that it's the pastor's job to make disciples? I hope not. Are you still bought in that it's the pastor's job to make disciples? Or maybe it should say it's only the pastor's job. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. How many know it's not only my job? If you're bought into it's the pastor's job to make disciples, that's not biblical. Right? Because how many know we're all called to go make disciples, right? Or are you bought in that I am called to make disciple makers? All right? You're going to be bought into one of these two things. 
You're either going to be bought into, I will come to church once or twice a month. Hopefully this guy is funny. He's not too challenging. And, 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 I, and Because it's his job to make disciples. Or you're going to buy into, you know what? God has called me to make disciple makers as well. And it's, your, it's up to you on which one you're going to be bought into. All right. I'm going to talk about water baptism real fast. Years ago, I got a text after one of our water baptism services. And it went kind of like this. It was a group text. And it was, Pastor, praise the Lord. We baptized nine men, 15 ladies, eight teenagers, and 22 kids. I'm extremely mature and very spiritual. And on that group text, and I added, and we also baptized one wig. And you're like, why did you put that in there? Because one lady got baptized and her wig went floating down the pool. I thought it was hilarious. Most people on the, on the thread were cracking up, and one lady was saying, shame on you, Pastor. She's no longer with us. Anyway. One year, we baptized a guy with a tether. Dude had a tether on, man. We held his foot out of the water, and we submerged that sinner. <laughs> Listen, water baptism, it's, it's not salvation. Water baptism is your public proclamation that you are a Christ follower. It's you telling others that I follow Jesus. And you're confessing to others publicly that I follow Jesus. And water baptism, it's not really discipleship. It's a part of discipleship. Water baptism is your first step towards discipleship and obedience to following Jesus, right? Isn't that really what it is? See, those ready to get water baptized have bought in to obeying and following Jesus. Let me say that again. They have bought in to following Jesus and obeying Jesus. Here's the question. How about you? Right? Now, you, you might have arrived today, and you're like, I didn't plan on getting baptized. I came to see my nephew get baptized, my cousin get baptized. I saw a packed parking lot. I just pulled in. I don't know why I'm here. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit is starting to tug on your heart a little bit and saying it's time for you to publicly declare your faith through water baptism. Now, I do have a, a scripture for you in Acts 22. Uh, listen to this. Says, and now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized. You know? You may be going, hey, preacher, I, there's no way I'm getting in that pool. I don't have a change of clothes. We got you covered. Eh? We, got, we got you covered. We got a change of clothes for you. Right? You may be going, I, 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 I can't do that. I don't have a towel. We got you covered, okay? And it's a fresh towel. I've seen them, all right? All right? And you may be going, but, but, but I don't have one of those cool, cool, real shirts. We got you covered. You decide to get water baptized today, you're going to get a free T-shirt. So I, I just, before we move on, say, it's time for me to publicly declare that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And, I, and, and along with these other 20 or so people, I'm going to get water baptized today. What am I waiting for? And the real question is, what are you waiting for? So to my far right, is there anybody with a raised hand you'd say, I'm willing to, to get water baptized today. I didn't plan on it, but I'm ready today because I am a follower of Jesus. Praise the Lord. I love it. There's a hand right there. It's true. I love it. I think I see another one here. Three, four. Getting ready to break the rock record. I love it. What are you waiting for? How about to my far left? You raise your hand. And say, I didn't plan on getting baptized, but it's time. It's time for me to publicly declare my faith in Jesus. All you're going to do is go back in the water and come right up. Woo! I love it. Love that. Anybody else? There's a hand right there. I love it. Woo! Come on, mess that hair up. All right. Anybody in the center here? 
with a raised hand, you're like, it's time for me to publicly declare my faith in Jesus. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Hallelujah. Way to go. Man. Woo! All right. You see Wendy over there? Do a little dance, Wendy, something. That, whoa. All right. All right. She's got her, 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 her phone light on. If you raise your hand, you're going to get your shirt. You're going to get some basic instructions on water baptism. I need to stand up and head over to Wendy. All right? All right. Woo! I love it. <laughs>